Welcome to this week's Ask GMBM. We've got some great questions. Great questions. Are you sure? Come you read yes, them? I've read them. They're great. Some They're of them great, are Neil. mediocre. These questions, of course, we are finding in the comment sections below these videos, and you're welcome to add your questions for next week's show today, of course. Yeah. Um, and we're using the hashtag Ask GMBN. So if yeah. you've got any questions you'd like to find out about mountain biking, then please send them over. Well, I can't wait. Considering yeah. they're so good, these questions this week, Let's, it's going to be exciting. Let's dive right in. Right, let's get into it with Simply Board's question. He's saying, uh, I currently have a non-boost uh, 15 by 100 mil fork mm -hmm. that I'm looking to upgrade. Uh, my bike shop is having a hard time locating a non-boost fork. Um, are there any issues with running a hub conversion kit? Um, no, as long as you there is one available for your wheel. You don't want to try and bodge it with spacers or washers. But I'm guessing that, you know, Decent wheel brands, you'll just be able to buy those sort of end caps that go on your hub. So, yeah, pretty simple, really. You just have to then you know line up your new your brake caliper on the new fork. I guess it saves you buying a new wheel, um, and then you've got a boost fork for the future when you do an upgrade wheel. So it's probably quite a good way of doing it. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, what are the advantages advantages of having a boost fork over a? Well, there aren't really. Other, it's the wheel that brings the advantage. So you're right. not going to quite. It's the uh, spoke bracing angle of the wheel. Mm. But you're going to get a new fork. I would be yeah. surprised you can't buy an old fork for cheaper that isn't the, the non-boost, mm. but that's, that's what you're saying. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Jim Wade asks, how do I find out about mountain bike races near me? Uh, well, um, there's lots of ways you can actually, but it's basically start communicating with the community of mountain bikers. So you will find them in your local bike shop, down your local bike trail, um, the local bike park if there is one around you. Yeah, um, it's a really there's lots of ways, but of course you can you can go online uh, and just and search that, and you will get some great results, and you'll definitely What's find that thing that begins with G. I can't remember. I can't remember. Good. Google. Let me Google it. Oh, it's Google. Google. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basically, I always think the best way to do it is to talk to people because you'll get an idea of what the races you're looking at, a better idea of what those races yeah. are going to be like from that sort of actual experienced point of view. But of course, yeah, you can search online and find them. But what you should do is do it. That's yep. what you should do. I got into it. Friends. Friends told me who were into riding more than I was. Said, mm -hmm. oh, there's this thing over there the next weekend. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be frightened to go along, have a look first. If you're nervous about going to a race and like, can I, can't I do it? Go along and have a look because you'll definitely meet people there that will say, come on, have a go. Because yeah. they want people there and you'll have a fantastic time. Uh, RK Boss 97 I want to find out if my steerer tube on his fork is tapered or not, but I don't have a torque wrench and my local bike shop will probably charge me. What should I do? <laughs> well, I can tell you, right, I have never used a torque wrench, and I've been a professional cyclist, <laughs> or was a professional uh, cyclist, for 25 years. You don't so need. So you don't need one. And when people use torque wrenches, I always have a bit of a quizzical look and go, huh, neat. <laughs> yeah, nice. um, I would right. imagine your bike shop probably won't charge you for a simple question like that. The only grey area is maybe if you're thinking, oh, I want to check if I've got a tapered uh, steerer because I want to buy a new fork and I don't want to buy it from you, basically. But mm. I doubt they'll charge you. Basically, all you need to do, is pretty simple anyway, is undo your stem bolts, undo the top cap and just slide your fork out a little bit and you'll be able to see at the bottom. It'll be one and one eighth at the top and one and one half at the bottom if it's tapered. You don't even have to take the fork the whole way out, probably. Right, yeah. Pretty yeah. simple to spot. Yeah, you have a look yourself. You get those Allen keys out, don't need to. Um, and if you're uh, concerned and you want to work out how to uh, do that video-wise, um, I know a channel that's quite helpful for that. Ta-da! The tech so, channel. Yeah, let's have a look. Oh, the tech, is we going to tech now? We are. Oh, <laughs> used to be good for tech. <laughs> Doddy stole it all, made a channel out of it, really good one. Yeah. Damn him. Anyway, let's go and have a look at one of his videos. So the first thing to undo on your cockpit is your stem clamp bolts. They're the bolts that hold your stem onto the steerer tube. Next, you're gonna to need to undo your five millimeter bolt that keeps the cap on the top and preloads the bearings. Whilst you do this, you wanna be holding the crown of the fork because there's a good chance that it could just drop out at this point, depending on how tight the fit is. Mark. Frankowiak, 
Uh, asking when a gearbox is coming, Neil. For goodness sake, more, sp more specifically, will they become a standard? Well, they are here. Yes. They are far from standard. What's uh, that brand? Pinion. Pinion. That's the they, one. You've got loads of gears, haven't they? I can't remember yeah. how many, but yeah, big range. Look the at problem this one. is they're, well, there's a few problems. They're expensive, yeah. they're heavy, they have lots of drag. Do you remember the old Honda downhill bikes? That's yeah. what those guys, like Min, I used to complain about. They actually, yeah. when they were freewheeling, the bike would slow down quite quick. Um, did I say they're expensive? You did, and you, and they have to use on that pinion one, exactly, uh, specifically, you have to use the old grip shift, yeah. which is, I think that's a great, We've been talking about Sister gearboxes anymore. since the Honda, probably before the Honda, so that's a long time ago now. So mm. they haven't really hit the market and become popular. Mm. Maybe if someone like Shimano or SRAM takes it on and says, we're going to do this, they will, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Mm. Well, we'll see. It's a good question. Good it question. Is. Like, where are they? You probably it makes sense because people yeah. break rear max all the time, so it would mm. be nice to not be able to have that, but simply it is the best way of doing it currently. Yeah. Yeah, you're stuck with it for now. Yep. That's basically the answer. Um, Jake Watling's got a question here. Why do I always find it really difficult to read the ground and make line choices on ground that's grassed over? You know those trails where you've kind of lost the details of the train because because a bit of like uh, vegetation has taken over. I mean, I rarely ride stuff like that. To be More like in the olden days when I raced downhill, you mm. would ride a lot of stuff like that, but not yeah. so much now. One way, it, it, the old glasses, isn't it? It helps on the old line choice. Well, I uh, talked about yeah. the Oakleys in the Dirt mm. Show, um, with that prism lens, and there are other brands that have this as well. I forgot, mm. I think Smith to do something similar. Basically filters out different wavelengths of light, so it gives you more contrast. That's that incredible. might help. Mm. Um, what do I get in your eyes checked? I do know uh, riders in the past have had short sightedness, and actually doesn't help you pick lines. No, it definitely doesn't. Dan Athton, he used to wear, he started wearing contact lenses and became 10 seconds faster. Yeah, and I tell you what, there's actually something that they've uh, tested for on very famous races in lots of motorsports. Uh, people like Valentino Rossi and uh, people like Kenny. Um, Valentino, have you met Valentino? I'm, I may have met him. I'm joking because I've heard this story 20 times. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I was about to tell it again. Um, so that day I met, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those those people have been tested that win Formula One races and MotoGP and things like that. And it's well known that their eyesight is way above the norm. Mm. Uh, so it is a very important point. It's like if your eyesight's really fantastic, you're probably going to go really good because you can spot braking points much quicker and yeah. much better. Has anyone like a Formula person. One driver or a MotoGP rider ever worn glasses inside their helmet? Like um... Yeah, I want to say yes. I think I've got a picture in my mind of someone who did, but I'm not an F1 expert. I find it boring. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, eyesight, glasses, um, maybe ride the trail slowly beforehand and go back up and hit it hard. Yeah. That's a good way of doing it. Um, right, uh, got any more questions, Neil? Uh, I haven't, but this guy has. Connor Onglesby, will the volume spaces mess up my sag settings? Thanks, love the videos. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Will it? Um, well, technically yes, because you have to let all the air out to put your spacer in, so that'll mess up your sag settings. But I'm being a bit facetious, is that the right word? I don't know. Basically, me measure your pressure that was in there. Yes. Then let it out, stick your volume spacer in, and stick it back up to that pressure, because it shouldn't affect how hard you have your fork. Right, Because it see. only affects the travel at the end, not the start. So yeah. it should, should be the same. Yeah, and if you're as confused by suspension settings as I am, then why don't you take a look at this jargon buster we did previously. So first up is compression. Now this refers to the way damping is controlled on a shock or a fork, for example, uh, specifically the way it's controlled when it compresses. The adjustment for compression is usually a blue dial or a switch. Oh, now I know. Do you? Yeah, well, nearly. I'm not very good with suspension. <laughs> I, like, I know how I want it to feel. Which I guess is the hard bit. Yeah, true. Yeah, but I, but I can't get it to that. I have to ask someone else to do it, basically. Uh, yeah. right, plenty more questions here. Samuel Shardlow, is it a good idea to put a longer fork and shorter stem on my Trek Top Fuel 8 cross-country bike? Would this make it more suited to downhill and make it more like a trail bike? I was thinking of going from a 140 to a 130 or 140 and putting mm. a 50 mil stem on it. Please let me know if it's an awful idea. It's not an awful idea. Um, it's top fuel eight. Is that a short travel bike or is it a hardtail? That is what I want to know. 
All right, well, while Neil's checking that out, um, I would say that I can see what you're thinking. It is gonna slightly, it's gonna increase the wheelbase, to, and it's, but it is gonna raise the bottom bracket quite a lot if you go from uh, up to a 130 or 140, it's gonna be a big jump up. It's the full smash bike, I, I yeah. knew that, I knew yeah. that. Um, I would go up to 120, I wouldn't go more than that, would be right. my advice, which I've just done, and plenty of other people did at BC Bike Race, 100 mil uh, on the back, 120 up front, gives you that desired effect of being better downhill, and I put a 50 mil stem on, or was it 60? Oh, I forgot. Um, but it, it does, you know, you're always gonna compromise at the other end. So if you're, and I have done recently, after converting the bike, riding a technical steep climb, you're gonna have to work quite a lot harder to keep your front wheel down on the floor, and that is pretty uncomfortable, getting into that position to do it. Yeah. So it will make the bike better downhill, you will suffer a little bit on the steep technical climbs. Well, very cool, that was an expert opinion when you want one, wasn't it? So that was very good. Um, right, that buckle dude says, do you think pump tracks are good for beginners? They're the best. They're ace, aren't they? Uh, I think you will learn an awful lot of skills on a pump track that can be not converted, just mm -hmm. simply translated to other types of riding, whatever it is, yeah. cross country, downhill, whatever. So yeah, yeah. definitely. You know, one thing I think's really great with pump tracks is you learn an awful lot about your bike's geometry because you really start thinking, when you look at the pump track to begin with, you've, you've got a certain perception of what you think it's gonna be like, then you ride around it and your bike's like, whoa, they're, yeah. much, they're such a cramped space. Everything's tightened up and you really have to learn that geometry of like, well, when the front wheel goes up one side, yeah. the back wheel starts coming up behind you and you have to like think, I'm gonna have to jump that bit, I'll have to manual through, great for that. Fantastic. You'll get fit as well, because yeah. they're, they're hard work. They're such cool things to play with, and mm -hmm. fun, such fun. Uh, right, Robert, uh, just Robert. It's just Robert asking this question. Um, yeah. Do you think it's worth investing in a bike sat-nav for riding MTB trails? Um, do you think it brings more to the ride? Well, Neil, I know you've tested this out. Uh, well, also Robert's saying, can the screen or stats be distracted? And that's an important point, I think. Um, I would say no, I think they're not distracted. I think they're great. Full disclosure, we're sponsored by Garmin, so I'm lucky enough to have all the full range. And I do use them slightly differently. So I've got the, the big 1030, which is the big screen. I use that more on my road bike, to be honest, for or big long rides where you've got a huge map and it's really easy to read. Most of the time I'll then go down to quite a minimal one. And you can get them above your stem, so they're, they're really small things. And I love being able to plan a ride that is massive, can be, take four hours, and not have to be getting you know a map out or looking at my phone every five minutes. Yeah. It's there, and if you don't want to look at it, you can always you know, swipe the screen to something else. Mm. Or if I really don't want to be distracted, I'll use my watch, because you've got, I've got Commute and all those apps mm. on here as well, so I can use this for navigation. Mm. However, I don't do that very often. I use this more for actually just tracking the ride and use mm. a computer screen for doing that. Yeah, I right. think they're great. Yeah, and I'll tell you what else about the watch, actually, something because I've been trying that watch out, um, which I wouldn't normally wear, and it is bomb proof. That thing can yeah. take a smack. It really can. It's tough. I would, Super tough. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. Yeah. Um, right. We've also done a video on this, Neil, Ooh. as you well know. I made it. Uh, yes. With Blake. Uh, so yeah, let's take a look at this video of uh, telling you how to use that GPS if you've got one. You can also then start digging into the actual setup of your computer and working out what data you want on the screen. I like to keep it fairly minimum and sort of group them together. So I've actually got five screens that I can swipe through. The first one is my sort of data. So I've got my distance, time of day, the timer, so how long you've been going on the ride, total ascent and max speed. I don't normally have max speed, actually. I normally have uh, my elevation. Uh, so you can then swipe through and then I've got my map screen. So if I'm riding using navigation, that's the one I'll probably use most of the time. Then I've got my elevation uh, grade. You know, so you've got the graph of how high you are and what you've been doing. That also has a little compass and my elevation on there. Correct me if I'm wrong, this bit's brilliant. I love this bit of the show. Love it. We get to see something you guys have done and then we try and fix it or congratulate you for it. Positive feedback, I would say. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, maybe not always positive. Well, feedback. I'll be positive and you'll have feedback. How's that? Uh, right. Let's try it. Nolan is hitting this sweet jump on his giant fathom uh, in his local woods. Oh, whoa! I mean, I like the jump. Bit of drift. a dead sailor. Check out the drift. Yeah. Along. Yeah, we've all been there, we've all done it. I tell you what, it's wrong, okay? I'm gonna say it's wrong, but what you do do is land in and then totally nail that corner. I've you do it. it by accident, 
but it's very good. I paused it in the middle of the jump. You can <laughs> see your sort of whoa, yeah. your weights go into the one side of the bike. Really, really common. Who see this all the time coaching? And it sounds stupid, but it's going back to doing manuals and rather than pulling on the bars, because that's what's probably happened, or you've stayed above the bike and you've pulled and not got the same pull, because obviously you sort of stand asymmetrically on the bike, you won't get a symmetrical straight up pull. And that's why you go, whoa, hang on, and go sideways. And it gets worse and worse, the bigger the jump is. So you've got to go, go back to using your weight centrally over the bike, and that will start lifting the bike centrally and straight. Uh, so it goes back to the manual, hips back over the bike. God Pra damn, you're good. Practice I the manual. <laughs> I think I just got better then. Uh, I mean, we all, uh, it's, it's, it is a dead sailor, and that does yeah. just come from just like whoa, twisting on the bike as you're trying to jump. That was really, really good, Neil. I'm quite impressed. Um, uh, that was, yeah. Oh, thank I'm you. not going to add anything because anything I add will just be pointless. Keep sending them in. It's great with videos. That's why we do this section on our ass because we can slow mo the video and hopefully try and give you some good riding advice. Anything, any type of ride you do it, send it in. Absolutely, um, we love seeing it. If you would like to see more from GMBN, then make sure you click just here for another video. Um, make sure you leave your questions down below. Yep. Um, what's this big red thing? Neil, that thing. Oh, that thing. Click it to subscribe and um, give us a thumbs up. We're real like. YouTubers, aren't we? Aren't we? Like... Well, we'll see you next week.